I've added quite a few features to my ECS-based 3D dungeon crawler. First, I had to upgrade to Go.4, but there wasn't much to fix because the project is still relatively small. As you can see, I've added a first-person camera, and you can switch to third-person by scrolling out the mouse wheel. You can turn left and right and look up and down by moving the mouse. And I still use the WASD keys to move forward, back, left, and right. So you can still collide with the enemies to deal damage, but now the rooms spawn health potions and magical spell scrolls as well. The items are affected by physics, so when the player or enemies run into them, they slide around on the floor. To pick them up, you look at the item and press X. Currently, I've only added the confusion, fireball, and magic missile spells, but of course, I'll add more in the future. The mouse is captured by the game window by default, so to access your items, you'll use middle mouse or hit escape to free the mouse, and click on the inventory tab. You can adjust the size of the mini bar by clicking on the divider, which automatically resizes the game window so your menus aren't blocking half the screen. From here, you can drop all your loot in a pile on the ground, which is arguably one of the best features in RPGs. They stay frozen in the air until the player moves forward, because I've frozen the physics process between frames. And to use the health potions, you'll select the item in the inventory and click use to regenerate health. The spell scrolls will fire a projectile in the direction that you're facing. The arcane missiles do 20 damage to a single target, and they are frozen until the player moves, as you can see. Even the particle effects are frozen when you disable the process node. The confusion scrolls make the enemy walk around in random directions and attack their friends if they run into them. It's kind of hard to get them close enough, but they don't deal damage to the player, so that's at least helpful. And the fireball scroll generates a big explosion AoE, which can deal damage to multiple targets. It's easier to aim at the floor between them than trying to hit multiple from one enemy. And you do want to be careful because the fireball can deal damage to the player as well. The mechanics are based on the Rusty Roguelike tutorial from bfnightly.bracketproductions.com. This is a great resource for learning about entity component systems, so I'll put a link in the description. Of course, I do have to change a lot because I'm converting it from Rust and making it three-dimensional. In this version, I worked on the user interface, added the items and inventory, and the range scroll targeting. I've already done the saving and loading in the first episode, so next time I'll add more layers to the dungeon, difficulty, and player equipment. In the original version, 
spells are targeted with a circle on the ground and you can select a target and if you don't select a valid target it remains in your inventory so this is like an instant cast but I wanted the spell system to be more like Skyrim which is why I added the bolts and the effects instead. So I had to write a whole new system for the projectiles and the AoEs. In my version, I've made the spell projectile a rigid body, so I can set the linear velocity and it will keep flying forward. I set the gravity scale and linear damp to zero, because I don't want the spells to be affected by physics but I will enable these for the arrows and thrown weapons. Then I'm using a particle emitter with global coordinates to make the trail behind the missile. I set the shape to a cylinder for the missile with the color ramp at a gradient and the scale reducing over time. Then for the fireball, I'm using a sphere mesh with the color ramp shifting from yellow, red, and black. And this scales over time as well. As you can see. Now in the dungeon builder class, I've added a function to spawn items in the rooms. In the scrolls, I've added the summons projectile component, which takes the scene path, the display name, and the speed in meters per second. I added a consumable tag, which makes the item disappear from your inventory when you use it. And I've added components for inflicts damage, range, area of effect, and inflicts confusion. Then in the inventory system, I have a use items function, which gets all the entities with the use item component. If the item provides healing, queue healing in the healing system. If the item is consumable, add the needs removal component to the item, which unrenders it and deletes the entity and all its components from the dictionaries. And if it has the summons projectile component, then it adds the summoning projectile component with the item ID. Then I get all of the entities with the summoning projectile component in the projectile system. Here I make a new entity for the projectile and set the projectile scene and name from the item. Then I add the inflicts damage area of effect and inflicts confusion components if they are in the item. And I set the position from the player hands position. Then I get the direction facing, which is a 3D raycast node. I set the rotation of the projectile to the direction facing global rotation. Then I get the direction from the global transform dot basis dot Z, which is the blue arrow in the editor. And I set the linear velocity to the normalized direction times the projectile speed. So in the player scene, I have a marker 3D for the hands position, which is the point where I summon the projectile from. Then the raycast 3D is the direction facing. And these three arrows are the basis transform and 
the blue arrow is the basis.z. So as the player looks up and down, this will change and it will affect the trajectory of the projectile. So now when I render the projectile in the render system, I make a new instance of the scene and set the position and rotation, then set the linear velocity so the projectile flies forward at a constant rate, and finally I connect the body entered signal from the projectile node to the body entered function in the collision system and bind the projectile node and ECS parameters so it passes to this function whenever the projectile collides with another body. So in the projectile scene, I've set the spell to collision layer 4 and have it mask with the terrain and characters so it can collide. Then I turned on continuous collision detection and set the max contacts to 1 so that it can report collisions and enable contact monitoring as well. I also disabled can sleep so it doesn't freeze then I connected to the body entered signal in the render system, which automatically passes the node that it collided with, and I bound the other two parameters so I didn't have to write a special function in the entity class. So when the spell collides with another body, it calls the body entered function in the collision system. If the entity is a projectile, add the projectile hit to the entity with the collider ID as the value. Then in the projectile system, I get the entities with the projectile hit component. If the projectile has the area of effect, add the summoning area of effect component to the projectile. Otherwise, add the ranged hit with the array of the target ID and cue the projectile for removal. I'll add a toggle for this later so that persistent projectiles like arrows don't get deleted here. Now in the area of effect system, I get the entities with the summoning area of effect component and I create a new sphere shape for the raycast here, set the radius and transform to the projectile position. I want to exclude the projectile itself, then get the result of the shape cast from the direct space state and append all of the entities that collided, and finally add the ranged hit with the array of targets to the projectile. For the AoE itself, I only deal damage once, but I'll probably add mechanics for damage over time as well. So I just create the particle scene from the projectile summons AoE component and set the duration so that it will clean up whenever the particles are done playing. So the ranged hit component is added whether the damage is from the AoE or the single target projectile. In the combat system, I get all of the entities with the ranged hit component and loop over the target IDs Cue the damage from the inflicts damage on each target using the damage system. And if the spell inflicts confusion, add that component as well. Now the AoE particle system 
is handled with the duration system, which subtracts the delta from the remaining duration component, and if it's less than zero, add the needs removal to the entity. This is good for particle effects like the fireball explosion, but I can also use it for conjured items as well. And finally, in the entity cleanup system, I get the entities that need removal and check if it's contained in an inventory and remove it if it is. If the entity is rendered, queue free the rendered node. And finally, call remove entity from the ECS. This just loops over the components in the entity and erases them from the component dictionary then removes the entity ID from the entity dictionary as well. I do call the cleanup entity system last in the state run systems function, so all the other systems have a chance to run on the entity before it gets deleted, and they don't throw a null pointer exception. The confusion system is pretty straightforward, it gets all the entities that are confused and assigns a random direction times the entity movement speed as the velocity and adds the move component with the velocity as the value to the entity. Then it reduces the confused duration by the delta and if the duration is less than zero, remove the confused component. In the monster AI system, I do make sure the monster is not dead or confused, but I call the confusion system after the monster AI, so it would overwrite the behavior anyway. And in the move system, if the entity is confused, I make it deal damage half the time, regardless if the collider is friendly or an enemy. I did add a range component to the spell scrolls, so the missiles will dissipate when they reach the maximum range, and the fireball will generate the explosion AoE. To accomplish this, I added a ranged component to all three spell scrolls and whenever the projectile is summoned, I transfer the ranged component onto the projectile entity. Then in each frame, I get the projectiles, and if it has a ranged component, get the distance traveled, which is the linear velocity length times the delta, and subtract it from the remaining range. If the remaining distance is less than zero, and it has the area of effect component, I'll add the summoning area of effect. And in either case, I cue the projectile for removal. And to pause the projectiles and the particle systems midair, I made a pause and unpause game function, which sets the game window viewport process mode to disabled and inherit when you toggle. So in the process function, physics process, if the state is run, unpause the game, otherwise pause the game. So it only runs the physics system if the player has put an input. And it is a bit laggy when I'm recording, but it runs a lot smoother when I just play the game. So you can definitely download it from the GitHub to see it working better. The fireball explosion is a particle emitter with the particle mesh set to a sphere. I've enabled 
transparency in the material so you can change the transparency alpha channel on the color and I've also enabled the vertex use as albedo so that the color ramp can be used instead of the material color. Now you don't want all of the particles to be the same color like this, so I turn the lifetime random all the way up, which will randomize the lifetime of the particles slightly, and so they are different colors at different times. I also added a little bit of hue variation as well. I also increased the emission shape to a sphere and turned the spread all the way up so they shoot out in all directions. And they have an initial velocity of 0.125, to 5, so they don't all go the same distance. I also make them get smaller over time using the scale curve. I did turn up the explosiveness to 0.9. If you turn it down, you can see they constantly emit. And if I turn it all the way up, then they spawn all at the same time. So I want the spawn time to be slightly staggered, which varies the colors a bit more. Now I have one shot enabled because I only want the explosion to play once, but that means that the emitting is disabled by default. So I've connected the ready signal to the restart function, which is a built-in function for the particle system, which makes the particles emit when it enters the scene. And I don't think that any of these signals are emitted when the particle system is done playing. It would be nice if they added one, but I used the duration component for that instead. Since the explosion is a particle emitter instead of a rigid body or kinematic like the other characters, I thought I would need to make a separate entity script for this, but it turns out you can just extend node and attach it to all the different entities, and I'm still able to call the move and slide and get the specific signals from the nodes, so it looks like it doesn't matter actually what you extend in the script for all of that to work. Now since I switched from top down to third person first person camera, I want to move the player relative to the direction it's facing, so in the process I get the input keys and instead of using the up, down, left, and right vectors, I get the global transform dot basis dot x for the left and right and basis dot z for the forward and backwards. And you can just add these together to make the character strafe. Then you'll normalize the move direction and multiply it by the movement speed to get the vector. So the transform basis again is the arrows in the middle of the node. The basis dot z is the blue arrow and the basis dot x is the red arrow. So for reference. Then in the input function, if the mouse is captured in the game window, 
use the mouse movement to rotate the player body left and right and the direction facing raycast node up and down and I mapped the middle mouse scroll to zoom in and out on the player camera. To lock the mouse in the game window, set the input mode mouse mode to input mouse mode captured in the ready. And in the input, if the escape key is pressed, I set the mouse mode to visible. Then I connected to the game window's GUI input signal. And here, if you left click on the window or middle mouse, it will recapture the mouse. And you can use middle mouse to release it as well. Then in the render system, if the entity has the player component, add the player camera as a child of the direction facing Raycast node. This makes the camera follow the player around and point in the direction that it's facing. I'll probably make this a remote transform at some point, so it's easier to switch between player characters, but this works for now. Then for the player camera, I have a spring arm 3D as the root with a camera 3D as the child. This lets you adjust the spring length and the camera moves in and out. So the spring arm 3D is mostly used in third person cameras, as it says in the editor and it uses ray casting to figure out where the walls are so the camera won't clip with the surroundings. And in the script, I have a maximum zoom. Then for the zoom in function, I reduce the spring length and in zoom out, I increase it, but I keep it within the bounds of zero to the maximum zoom. Now, since I don't have any light sources in my scene, the screen is black by default when I add the camera 3D. So to fix this, I'll add a new environment to the camera. And under background color, you can change the energy multiplier to add background light to the scene. So now you can see when you adjust the energy level, it makes the scene brighter and darker. This will work for now until I add some torches. So initially I was having an issue where the camera was clipping through the walls, floor, and ceiling. Even though the scroll arm 3d is masked on the first layer and so are the walls floor and ceiling i finally figured out that the problem was the scene is paused so i set the process mode to disabled between the player inputs and that's when you look around with the camera so if you have the disable mode set to remove, it can't collide with other objects like the camera. So if you set the disable mode to make static instead, then when you set the process mode to disabled, the collision shape is still able to be collided with. So now you can see that the camera moves forward instead of going through the walls and the ceiling. I also made the walls, floor, and ceiling 
into static bodies because they didn't need all the functionality from the kinematic and I think this is more efficient to keep these rendered because they don't have to report the collisions. Then I made resources for the different materials, the tiles, wood, and bricks. Assigning the different textures to each of the parameters. And then I can drag this material into the material on the mesh, like so. And ideally, I'll just have a wall shape and a floor mesh shape. And then I'll assign the material through the components instead so they'll be much more configurable. And of course, I'll want to fix the UVs, so as you can see, the bricks and the planks go upwards on the side, so I can just fix the UVs at some point to make them all lay horizontally. I got the textures from ambientcg.com, which is a great source for ground and rock, bricks, wood, metals, that kind of thing for your 3D models. And you can see that the license allows you to copy, modify, distribute, and perform the work even for commercial purposes without asking permission. So, you can use these in your commercial projects. Now, when you go to download the material and choose a resolution, you can see that the file comes with multiple different images. You have the base color, and displacement, occlusion, normals, roughness, and some of them have more. Then you'll want to drag these images into the different roughness, metallic, normal, and albedo texture slots to make the different effects. Now, I did notice that it looks like my walls are melting when you get up close. So I definitely need to learn more about the displacement on the materials. And now for the items. In Go.4, you can import the .blend files directly from Blender into Godot, which is very useful. You used to have to export it as a secondary file type, so you can see it pops up in the editor and you can change some of the settings here. It should see your blender automatically, but if it doesn't, you can go to editor settings and under file system import you can manually set the Blender 3 path, which installed to the snap directory for me automatically. Then you can drag the dot blend directly into the rigid body scene, and you can open this to generate a collision shape that matches the mesh, and if there's multiple meshes, you'll have to do that several times. And then you can copy this node back into the rigid body. And line it up with the potion. And for the healing potion, I add the provides healing component for 10 health when I spawn it in the dungeon builder.
Then in the use item function in the inventory system, if the item provides healing, queue the healing on the target for the amount. This just appends the amount to the receive healing array component if it has one and adds the component if it does not. Then in the healing system, I get the entities that have received healing, loop over the array and add the health to the current amount. If the entity health is greater than the maximum, then set the health equal to the maximum. And for the spell scrolls, I just have a blank scroll mesh that I imported from Blender. But the rolled up parts and the middle are different texture UVs. So in the surface material override, I can override the middle texture, set the albedo color to whatever I want. So I think that's pretty cool. Eventually I'll use runes and pictures of the projectile here instead. But this works for now. So initially I had the player masking with the item layer on layer 3. Then in the move system, if the player collided with an item, I emit the can pick up item signal from the ECS so the player could pick it up when it runs into it. This allows the player to walk into the items and pick them up when they're colliding, but I decided that I want the items to move out of the way when the player runs into it, so I changed them to rigid bodies instead. So you used to push rigid bodies with kinematic using the infinite inertia option in the editor. This was called one-way collision, but now you can set up the collision layers so the character ignores the items while the item is colliding with the character. So in the health potion and scrolls, I've set them to mask with the terrain, character, and other items. Then in the player, I'll disable the item mask. So now the items do get pushed when the player runs into them, but it no longer sends the collision signals to the player, so the pickup item doesn't work. That's why I made the direction facing a raycast 3D instead of just a marker. And I set the target position to 2 meters in front of the player. And in the main script, on input, I check if the Raycast is colliding with any entities, and if the entity is an item, set the pickup item to the collider ID. I do use the force raycast update since the player node is has the process mode disabled between frames. So now you can run into the items to move them around and you can look at them to pick them up using the X key and it gives you the prompt at the bottom so you know what it is. I actually prefer this mechanic because it feels more immersive. 
Now I've put the menus in a tab container. So each pane it has its own tab automatically generated and you can click between them. For the inventory, I've used a item list and you can add new elements like so through the editor and it works like a drop down so you select a single element and I've connected the use and drop buttons to the use item and drop item functions in the main script. This gets the currently selected item from the item list, if any are selected, then gets the item index from the player inventory and adds the use item or drop com item component with the item ID to the current player and finally set the game state to run. Then to update the inventory menu, I get the player inventory array and clear the item list. Then for each item in the player inventory, add the item name string to the item list. I add these in order so the index matches up with the player inventory. Then in the inventory system, to pick up the items, I add the contained in component to the item and flag it for unrender since it's going into the inventory. Then append the item ID to the player inventory and use items, we check for all of the components and apply the effects. And in drop item, set the component to needs rendered, and we'll render it at the player hands position with the rotation at zero. Then we'll remove the item from the inventory which just gets the container from the contained in component on the item and erases it from the inventory and removes the component. And for the user interface, I've set the main node to an H split container, which gives you the divider that you can move the screens left and right. I have a game window viewport container, sub viewport container for the game window, and a sub viewport as a child of that, which allows you to insert the viewport into the control scheme. And for the menu bar, I'm using a scroll container. I did this because I spend a lot of time looking through my inventory in RPGs, and I don't like how the inventory completely blocks out your character, so I wanted to have them separated so you could still see your character while you look through the inventory. By default, the viewport will be a static size. so. You can see it doesn't expand when I increase the window size or when I move the menu bar over. To fix this in the sub viewport container node, enable the stretch option. So now it automatically resizes and is completely collapsible. And to render the entities in the game window, I add them as a child of the game window slash sub viewport. Now, if you were to change the side panel to a different kind of container, 
like a panel container, which is what I wanted to use originally, you can see that the sidebar is limited to the size of the elements. You can't make it smaller than the buttons. So that's why I made the panel into a scrolling container instead, which allows you to completely collapse on both sides. And that's all the features that I've added to the IDK Little Dungeon Crawler. I am actually pretty happy with the progress. Next, I'll be working on Derpstar again. I still need to fix the Space Worm boss, but I haven't even opened it since converting to Go.4. The plan is to make the worm boss generic so I can add a different variation to each dimension. But that's all for now, so thank you for watching and have a great day.